Sophia, can you also send that to Miguel? The Michael Shipman photo? Yeah, yeah. Concerning that, we're live on Facebook. Um, can I make a suggestion? Yes, yes, Michael. The thing is that we don't have much time. Go ahead. Yeah, I sent a video just as Mireille did. Why? You don't want to do it live? Um, since I'm talking about the polar cuff photos, uh, it would be better to play the video with the photos on it. Okay, got it. Because exactly. Because my camera is not working. Okay, got and it. Three minutes and then give me just 45 seconds for the German movement and that would be it. So 45 minutes for the open? And then the video. Three, three minutes, three minutes uh, for the Polakov video that I sent. And after that, I'll speak 35, uh, 45 seconds on Copy. the German movement. Copy. Do you hear that, Malov? Uh, Jenna, you are live? Yes. We'll chat and discussion. We have to cease that right now. I mean, the, the video is anyway better than anything we could. Uh, okay, we're live. Week. Copy. We're live. Cool. My screen went back. Okay, we're live, Sophia. Okay, great. Okay, good afternoon, comrades, friends, media. Welcome, welcome. My name is Sophia Williams here in New York. Uh, a supporter in the Mumia Abu Jamal Freedom Struggle. We're happy to have you here today. Joining us at the launch weekend of Mumia Abu Jamal's 66th birthday. The first of this launch is this current press conference titled at 66 Mumia Abu Jamal fights legal, political, urgent COVID-19 battle. This weekend of events is significant in part as over the course of a month, uh, we have used groundbreaking technology in organizing the movement and bringing this all to you. We are here today to stand in solidarity with Mumia and all prisoners, especially during this unprecedented time of the pandemic. We have an amazing lineup of speakers who are longtime supporters that have remained relentless in seeking our brother, in seeing our brother walk free. Any questions you have, please write those in the chat and we'll be sure to ask them. Thank you. Now, now let's get started. So our first speaker will be Pam Africa. Pam Africa is from Philadelphia with the MOVE organization and the international family and friends of Mumia Abu Jamal. As a member of MU, she is the Minister of Confrontation. She has been fighting unapologetically since day one in support of Mumia. Also, as a fearless activist, she fights for international human rights and freedom. Sister Pam, you may go. I want to move and long live John Africa. I just want to say we want to first thank everybody for tuning in. And uh, this has been a long battle, and uh, but it's been a vigorating battle. Um, in 1981, when this government attempted to kill Mumia because of his outspokenness, um, they thought it would be a quick deal. But long live Don Africa, who told us to pull together the power of the people, and that we have been doing since... 1981 up to present day. And uh, um, 
I just want to thank people, and I want people to understand that this press conference will make you understand that Mumia is innocent, and we need you to help continue the work. So on the move, long live John Africa, and stay tuned for a very invigorating weekend on the move. Thank you, Pam. Okay. So next we have Santiago Alvarez. Santiago is a Mumia supporter and UC Santa Cruz student. Also where Mumia has been taking graduate, graduate student courses. Santiago, go ahead. Thanks, Sophia. On a move. Thank you, Pam, for that introduction um, to this wonderful event. Um, so I'm just gonna be speaking a little bit on what happened on April 15th. On April 15th, we were sending out uh, through social media images and urging people to call for Mumia's release. Um, and we provided phone numbers for people to call the jails in Mahanoy demanding for the release of Mumia demanding for the release of at-risk people in prison and all prisoners. And so one of the phone numbers that folks were calling was a phone number for the superintendent office at Mahanoy. One of my friends called this number at 5.04 PM and they got word that Mumia was being taken in ambulance to Scranton Hospital in Philadelphia, that he was violently ill so they alerted me and I called that same phone number at 5.04 PM. The person on the other line was a correctional officer and he confirmed this. He said that Mumia has been taken to the hospital around 30 minutes ago and that he's being tested for COVID-like symptoms. When I asked what these symptoms were, he told me lightness or he told me that uh, he was having a headache and trouble breathing. And so, um, I asked for this person's name and he told me his name was Philip Howard. And so I immediately uh, contacted Johanna, contacted Pam and alerted folks. Um, because, you know, this is something really, really serious. And so this really sent shockwaves throughout the whole community. People went into fight or flight mode and mobilized immediately for Mumia because we thought Mumia was severely ill and many of us thought that Mumia was even gonna die given his health conditions. So this was really scary for a lot of us and a lot of our hearts and minds, you know, were racing um, because we didn't know what was happening. Um, we didn't know where Mumia was at um, and we couldn't be in contact with him. So a lot of people were mobilizing during this time and I called back around 30 minutes later and the person on the other line was a CO who picked up um, and told me that his name was Daryl Miller. When I asked Daryl Miller what the status is of Mumia, he said that Mumia is fine, that Mumia is in his cell and no one has left the prison all day. And he told me all of this in a very relaxed voice um, and I was like, well, this is weird because that contradicts the information that someone named Philip Howard gave me. And once I said the name Philip Howard, he, he goes, who? Philip Howard? Who the hell is that? Who the hell is that? In almost a defensive way. And, uh, and, and so, um, you know, I, I recorded these, these audio messages, these phone calls, and you know, putting two and two together, this is the same exact person who was on both of these phone calls and who was clearly lying to my, to my face, to Nina's face um, in, these, uh, in the first phone call. Um, and this was really a, a sick and wicked thing to do um, as an official, as someone being paid to give out truthful information um, and this person was lying. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little bit about the uh, about this situation that happened on April 15th. Um, and it was really a 
it, while, while it was a big scare, it was also a reminder of the urgency of how vulnerable Mumia is and how we need to get him out of this prison immediately, as okay. well as so many other at-risk prisoners and political prisoners um, and all prisoners. So I just want to share that with y'all. Uh, free Mumia, free Ramal, long live John Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Santiago. Great, next we have Professor Lynn Washington. Lynn Washington is a professor of journalism at Temple University in Philadelphia. Professor Washington continues to work as a professional journalist where he specializes in investigative news coverage and analytical commentary. Washington's reporting and research examines issues related to social justice, race, racism, and international affairs. Professor Washington. Hello, thank you uh, for allowing me to uh, participate in this. I wanna talk about a rarely uh, discussed topic and that's corruptions in the court. Yes, we know that the very corrupt uh, behaviors of Judge Sabo, what often gets lost is the corrupt behaviors of the appellate courts, particularly the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, as well as federal courts all the way up to the US Supreme Court. This issue of corruption in the courts is very important because courts are where corruption is supposed to be um, dealt with, it's uh, where justice is supposed to be delivered. So when you have this corruption in the courts, it perverts all sense of uh, justice. One of the problems in the Mumia case, in fact, the biggest problem in the Mumia case related to the courts is that courts ignore their previous rulings. And that's supposed to be a no-no, but it's a yes-yes with the Mumia case. So much so that it creates what is called, or what I've called the Mumia exception. It's amazing that in all of these years, all of these decades, that Mumia has been incarcerated in court rulings, you rarely see the word justice in connection to injustices related to Abu Jamal. In fact, one of the rare times that you see the word justice is in the uh, rulings over the last couple of years by a Philadelphia judge uh, named Tucker. And his uh, rulings deal with the corrupt dealings of a former member of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court who was also the DA in Philadelphia, uh, Ronald Castile. Just wanna do a few things because uh, I know we have a lot of other people on this call. In 1959, when Mia was four years old, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said that every defendant is entitled to all of the safeguards of a fair trial. And Mumia never had a fair trial or never had fair appeals. Let's take a quick look at what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court did. There was a case involving a state police officer who shot and killed a woman in a judge's office. Pennsylvania Supreme Court gave him a new trial when they said that the judge in the case made one small comment Sabo just harangued for the whole trial and also through the appeals uh, proceedings in 1995. No big problem to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Pennsylvania Supreme Court let two convicted gangsters who murdered a man in Philadelphia off because of prosecutorial misconduct. Pennsylvania Supreme Court gave relief to a bank robber who had been convicted of murder and they let him off directly from death row because of uh, misconduct by police and prosecutors. Interestingly enough, Mumia helped this murderer file his appeal and he got relief. Mumia has never gotten relief from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. The federal mm -hmm. courts and the um, US Supreme Court have ignored all of this. In fact, the US Supreme Court has given relief uh, on uh, to a convicted white racist prison gang member and a devil worshiper on the, on the issue of prosecutors misusing their association in these organizations. They never gave the same thing to Mumia Abu-Jamal when the prosecutor pilloried Mumia for his involvement in the Black Panther Party 12 years before this incident that he was falsely arrested for. Currently, the court is now dealing with uh, the involvement of Ron Castillo. If courts had followed their precedent, if they had followed their adherence to judicial ethics, Castile should never have participated in Mumia's 1998 appeal because he was a former district attorney of Philadelphia and the judicial ethics said that a former government official who knows about the case cannot participate in the case if he's a judge. But Castile did, and not only did he participate, but he called out in defending why he participated, 
the involvement of four other members of his court saying that all of them had involvement with the FOP. So in that ruling in 1998, you had five members of a seven member court who had been bought and paid for by the FOP still involvement in the case. Is that justice? No. I'll let you use the adjective before no that you care to. Castile should never have been involved in that case. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has perverted justice and just in the last few months, they've continued that perversion by allowing the widow of Officer Daniel Faulkner to get involved in the case when she has no standing at all to be involved in it. It is revenge and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has given a legal imprimatur to that revenge. So we can see from all of these incidents and that is just a few of the incidents that Momia has never received justice from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court or the federal courts, thus the need for all of us to do what we're doing, fighting for the relief and release of Mumia Abu Jamal. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you, Professor Washington. Next, we have Sister Janine Africa. Janine Africa is one of the Move Nine, unjustly imprisoned in 1978 and released in 2019 after 41 years. All of the remaining Move Nine members have since been released and freed. She's a revolutionary sister of Mumia Abu Jamal. Sister Janine. On the move, on the move, long live John Africa. I just want everybody to know that this situation with Mumia should not even be happening because if it was not for Maureen Faulkner filing this petition to hold up the appeals of Mumia, Mumia might have been released by now. But since he had them, we're telling everybody, look, we fought to get him off death row, and the system was mad about it. And we're fighting to get him out of jail, they're mad about it. And so what they are trying to do is, since they couldn't kill him on the streets in Philadelphia, since they couldn't execute him with the legal death sentence, they are now trying to keep him in jail until he dies by catching the corona or anything else. And we're saying we have to fight just as hard now as we did when he was on death row. So everybody need to know, get involved and don't let them kill Mumia in prison. We fought too hard, too long, and fight for all those people in prison that are susceptible to this corona disease. You know, they, this system has created these conditions, but we don't have to accept them. So fight hard, fight long until we get freedom for Mumia and be able to get freedom and help for all those people that are being subjected to this coronavirus in those prisons. Long live John Africa. Thank you, Sister Janine. Okay, next we have Professor Michael Schiffman, live from Germany. Professor Michael Schiffman is a linguist cultural scientist and translator in Heidelberg, Germany. He has translated works by Mumia Abu-Jamal, Noam Choms Chomsky, Angela Davis, Edward Said, and others, and is the author of a book and many articles on Mumia, as well as a contributor to the Mumia film, In Prison My Whole Life and Justice on Trial. Professor Michael. All right, do you have my video? Can you play it? Yes, give us one minute. Hello, I'm Michael Schiffmann, Mumia supporter and author of a book in Germany. And uh, the guy you, who you see on the screen is Petro P. Polakov. This is not working. Uh, who took important photos of the crime scene in the Mumia case, and uh, I'm telling you the story. Uh, the photographs were actually on an anti-Mumia website, and I immediately, because I had not seen them before, wrote to them. Give us a minute. No problem. It was Mireille's video. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, I'm Michael Schiffmann, Mumia supporter and author of a book in Germany. And uh, the guy you, who you see on the screen is Petro P. Polakov, uh, who took important photos of the crime scene in the Mumia case. And uh, I'm telling you the story. Uh, the photographs were actually on an anti-Mumia website. And I immediately, because I had not seen them before, wrote to them. They didn't respond, but the name of the photographer, Petro P. Polakov III, was one, on one of the photographs. And so it was possible for me to find him out immediately. And what he revealed was 26 photographs with stunning content. Generally, you can see on the photographs that the crime scene was quite systematically mishandled, but three important points stick out. Here you can see the first. This is the position where the foreign officer lay. This is the blood spot from his head. And what should be there on the photographs is divots in the sidewalk, because uh, three prosecution witnesses testified that Mumia had fired away at the foreign officer, hitting him only once and missing him several times. The divots are just not there. And on that account alone, the prosecution story falls apart. The very next photograph also shows something quite stunning. You see a police officer doing something a police officer should never do. Namely, he handles the guns that were involved, Faulkner's guns and Mumia's gun, with his bare hands in contradiction to his testimony at the trial where he said he had handled them properly. So that was a second lie that was simply revealed by these photographs. And the, photograph also, the photographs also revealed the third lie. Namely, this is the spot right behind the police officer's car from which a taxi driver called Robert Schobert said he had seen Mumia firing away at the officer the taxi cab was simply not there. Several photographs show it, and Polakov, in correspondence with me, uh, said he was not there even when I came. Ten minutes after the call came, a police officer had been shot. So this, in uh, very brief words, is the story of the Polakov photos. And uh, there is even more to those photos which uh, you can see on my academic website when you Google me, because I will post them and you can watch for yourself. Okay. Okay, great. All right. Yes, go ahead. Actually, I will post them tonight. Give me just 40 seconds uh, to talk about the German movement, which is probably one of the oldest uh, Mumia movements outside of the US. It started right away when Mumia's first appeal was rejected uh, in March 1989 and has been going on since that time for more than 30 years. Uh, we are still active in several towns in Germany, citizen towns in Germany, mainly uh, Frankfurt, Heidelberg, Nuremberg, and Berlin. Uh, we have done uh, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of events. And uh, one of the things we are active at at the moment is after we had to cancel Johanna's planned tour through seven uh, German towns. Uh, we will be sending 66 uh, birthday greetings to Mumia from friends and acquaintances of ours from all over the world. And they will be posted uh, on uh, platforms, uh, which we will tell you right away within the next couple of days. Awesome, great. Thank you, Professor Schiffman. Next, we have a video presentation from Marie Fanon Mendez France. Marie from France is the founder of the France Fanon Foundation and ex 
UN expert on the working group of experts on people of African descent. Hello, Mumia. Hello, everyone. April 24th, 2020. It's your birthday, Mumia, 66 years old. In an ideal world, free of racialization, we should celebrate it with you, with all your supporters and family. I say we should, because capitalism keeps showing its vengeful and deadly fangs. The coronavirus that strikes us all is another step in what predatory capitalism can do. Globalization has reached its goal. It affects all continents, but it follows a line of domination imposed by the white world. It mainly affects the most vulnerable, the exclude, including the elder, the invisible, including migrants, the richest of the earth. It affects those who are deprived of their freedom and their voice. Between the suffocating walls of the prison, of the prison, our brother and sister die, affected by coronavirus, as they die between the two narrow walls of their apartment or their frail shelter. Yes, I know, it's your birthday, dear Mumia. I know you have been in prison for 38 years, much more than the age you were when you were accused of murder that you did not commit. 38 years that justice has shown its racializing face and has ceased to be impartial. 38 years since the fraternal order of police decided to get your life, no matter how they get there. 38 years that your supporters have been fighting for your freedom with your family, with your friends. Supporter, we became your family. 38 years, Mumia, you give your voice to the voiceless of the prison, but also to all the voiceless all around the world. Looked up, Mumia gives a lesson in political solidarity. We know that this pandemic is affecting the body of the invisible, the poorest, wherever they are. We know that in the Western country, most affected are the body of black men, the body of migrants. We know, for example, that in France, the most affected are all those who live in lower income neighborhoods. The most controller are Arab and Blacks, and that they are victims of police violence in the stifling silence of disinformation. This pandemic, appalling avatar of capitalism, proves that it is urgent to denounce the fundamental articulation that there is between race and class. One cannot think of the world after without this equation, which guided the step of the white world. This world must change. We must force it to change and break with its ideology of domination, whether over the dehumanized and desacralized body of our black brother and all racialized people, but also over the belief that Eurocentered modernity is the only possible reference. Today, our earth is breathed but we continue to resist because tomorrow we want to celebrate your next birthday, Mumia, with you, released from the colonial yoke of prison. We must resist to build the next day in decolonial alterity and with a sense of humanity, thought and live decolonially. We must resist. There is no other choice if we want to assume our part of decolonial humanity. Dear friend Mumia, let us continue with you to fight for your liberation and that all of our brothers and sisters in prison because the system which oppresses us cannot, does not want, give them a place. Let's claim our place. Let's claim the same humanity for all. Let's resist and get reparation now. Great, thank you, Marie, for that video. We send her our thanks. Next, we have uh, Dr. Susan Ross. Dr. Susan Ross joined the Free Mumia movement in the early 90s. 
She was co-chair of the Free Mumia Abu Jamal Coalition in New York City from 2000 till 2016, and then became international spokesperson as she continues to be for the family and friends of Mumia Abu Jamal. Dr. Rock. I'm at start. Oh, did you not hear the beginning? No, no, you were on mute. Please start again. Okay, okay. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm very moved and inspired by the statements of my comrades that preceded me. The Free Mumia movement from its start was defined by its international character. The chant, Free Mumia, has been a worldwide battle cry for freedom since Mumia was framed and sentenced to death in 1982. During Mumia's appeals processes in the mid-90s, the courtroom was filled with supporters from Germany, France, Denmark, Japan, and other countries. Hundreds of resolutions were passed for his freedom, and huge support rallies were held from Germany to Brazil to South Africa and many, many more. International supporters, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu, came to visit Mumia and continue to do so to this day. Mumia was named an honorary citizen of Paris. A post office recognized stamp with Mumia's picture was printed in France, and the official French National High School Social Studies textbook included Mumia in its sec section on human rights. Two French cities named streets in Mumia's honor. In one case, that of St. Denis, a city of 100,000 mostly immigrants and people of color, the Fraternal Order of Police in the United States went crazy, demanding of France that they withdraw Mumia's name. Legislative bodies in this country called for sanctions against France if they didn't remove Mumia's name from the street. St. Denis stood firm by its choice and held yearly anniversary celebrations of the event, including the huge 10-year anniversary celebration just four years ago. International labor support for Mumia has also been significant, from the Dorochiba Japanese Railway Union to the Swedish Dock Workers Union to the General Union of Workers in Guadeloupe and many others. Ramona and Pam Africa were invited to Europe in the early 90s, and Pam met with Fidel Castro in Cuba in the year 2000. Later, we were invited to Algeria, to Haiti, to Venezuela, to Germany, and to Great Britain for Mumia to be honored. We also offered our solidarity to other countries' struggles, as when Mumia sent birthday greetings to Comandante Hugo Chavez on Chavez's last birthday on Earth, and the message was played all day long on Venezuela's public radio. International phone and email campaigns have been critical. When Mumia was seriously ill with hepatitis C in 2015, and the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections refused to provide him with the necessary medication, only with the worldwide campaign did we succeed in saving Mumia's life. Today, the support work around the world continues in France, in Mexico, in Great Britain, and so on. It, I won't go into the details because that would take too long, but the spirit of the support is impressive, and many of the same demonstrations in front of the U.S. Embassy in their respective countries where our supporters live go on to this day. Some of them have been going on for more than 25 years. I want to end by calling for Mumia's freedom, a call especially urgent now in the face of the deadly coronavirus pandemic. And we also call for the same immediate release for hundreds of thousands of other prisoners who are facing the same threat. Finally, I also call for honoring the great traditions of international solidarity. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Again, before we continue, please share your questions in the chat section and we will be sure to ask them and have them answered. Okay, so moving right along, we have Brother 
Raza Khan Shahid. Raza Khan is from Philadelphia and he's with Nation Time. And Nation Time does judicial research for inmates. Raza Khan is also a certified paralegal for 20 years. Brother Raza Khan. Yeah. We're not hearing you clearly. Brother Ross, I think you are on mute. Okay. No, no I'm saying I'm on the phone because the password I had didn't work on the computer. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, well, my name is Raza Khan Shaheed Wali. I do legal, search, re, legal, legal research for Nation Time Judicial Research. After doing 28 years in prison, near back to back, I came home in 2006. There was no innocent, uh, there was no innocent project in Philadelphia because Temple had closed theirs. That left only the Pittsburgh Innocent Project who had already gotten nine innocent people out of jail, arm and off a of death row. But that only took cases within a hundred mile radius and that left Philadelphia out. That's when I started the Philadelphia Innocent Project, which was encouragement from Ang Ang Angus Love from the Philadelphia uh, Institutional Law Project and Professor Bill Moshe, the Pittsburgh School of Journalism Innocent Project in 2009. Can you still hear me? Because I hear a lot of, uh, hello? Yes, yes, we are hearing you. I do hear the background noise, but go ahead. Beg your pardon? Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. In 2009, I received a cease and desist letter from Barry Shack from the New York Innocent Project. After checking with uh, Professor Moshe, he told me he, had sh he was shut down too. The, uh, the reason why, because the uh, Innocent Project only did DNA evidence, but the majority of people are in jail because prosecutorial misconduct, judicial misconduct, and all kinds of ineffective assistance to counsel. So, nation, so the Nation of Judicial Research was established. We are connected to 25 institutions, federal and state, and we have about 20 certified paralegals, AKA jailhouse lawyers. It was such a good thing that Mumia put out the book, Jailhouse Lawyers, because that made people start to look into uh, their situations a little more better with trusting inmates to a degree. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, most of the people, you'd be surprised. They can't even read or write. They ran multi-million dollar drug operations in there and they couldn't write, read. And the only thing they had to rely on is their... <laughs> Lawyers, what the lawyer told them. Uh, you know, and then you got people's families. They haven't been in so long. They don't have nobody but us. We send legal material. We send educational material. We send everything. And then even that, I had to send Mumia's uh, hepatitis C petition to other institutions because they don't even allow them to uh, be treated. There's so many things that's going on and so many things that's going wrong. Mumia should never be in jail. I mean, he should be out right now. And all they have to do is put in a motion to have him released and see what they say. Because he'll never get a fair trial. Thank you. We'll be seeing you. Mumia, soon. Believe that. Okay. Great. Thank you, Brother Raz. Reza Khan. Okay, so moving right along, we have Black Rap. Black Rap is an international hip hop artist hailing out of Pennsylvania. The name Black Rap Medusa. My apologies. The name Medusa is an acronym for making art different using skills and activism. From organizing to free black um, from organizing to free black mamas and political prisoners to protesting against police brutality. This artivist creates anthems for the movement. Black rap. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Frida Lance, Frida Maul, um, Free Mumia. Um, again, uh, my name is uh, Black Rap Medusa. Um, shout out to everybody who's on the call. Thank you for sharing your work and your continued support of um, uh, Brother Mumia and all uh, political prisoners. Um, I first got started with the work back in 2013 um, when I came to Philly for a, a celebration of Mumia's uh, birthday. Um, I was able to then organize in Pittsburgh where I was uh, living at the time. I was able to bring Mama Pam um, and Brother uh, Maroon Schultz III um, and uh, out to Pittsburgh and celebration of, um, of, of Mumia's birthday, uh, as well as a, a call to uh, free Mumia. Uh, we were able to raise some funds um, to contribute to um, Mumia, who was, I think, had gone into diabetic uh, shock at the time. Um, and so fast forward, um, still doing the work um, and continuing to support political prisoners and freeing our people. Um, just to, uh, you know, in present day, uh, talking about the COVID-19, um, the COVID-19 uh, bailouts and um, freeing all vulnerable populations, including our, our elders and um, um, mothers and caregivers, we have aligned ourselves with the national bailout. So um, we, I formulated an organization called the Dignity Act Now Collective, which is a um, formerly incarcerated uh, women um, and uh, non-gendered folks um, fighting for the freedom of um, black mothers and caregivers. Um, the COVID-19 disproportionately affects uh, mothers and caregivers, especially those who are incarcerated as there is no refuge um, in the cage. Um, also, they are not um, supplying the proper uh, protective needs to um, these people who are incarcerated. Uh, they are not um, reporting the correct numbers as to who is being infected, uh, nor are they providing the proper care. It's important to note that the cry to free Black mothers and caregivers um, impacts our community, um, especially when these are the people who are caring for our communities um, in this uh, time of crisis. So uh, we, we aligned ourselves with the National uh, Bailout, who are, doing, who are currently doing COVID-19 uh, bailouts. So if you want to support that work, um, you could hit me up uh, on Facebook, Instagram, B-L-A-K underscore R-A-P-P. Uh, the Dignity Act now has aligned with uh, several different organizations on the ground, both in Pittsburgh and in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has bailed out to date uh, about 97 people. Um, on Monday or Tuesday, we bailed out at least uh, nine uh, black mothers and caregivers and are continuing to raise funds to bail these women out but then to also pr provide resources housing uh, groceries um, access to COVID testing uh, again just noting that in um, the black communities that are impacted by COVID-19 the accessibility to protective gear accessibility to health care um, if you are diagnosed with the um, with the virus that there is um, little or no access to proper health care. Uh, these numbers are being skewed by um, different services that, that are providing or saying that they're providing this care. And um, it's important that we come for our people. It's important that we like um, go into the communities um, and provide access to protective gear, face masks and gloves, sanitizer. Those are things that our people are, are lacking access to. Um, so I just want to uh, shout out uh, Mama Pam, um, Mama Janine, um, for continued support of the work. Um, and it's uh, like again important to note that when it disproportionately impacts Black mothers and caregivers, we are looking at a disenfranchised community. So I just want to raise that up um, and free Mumia, um, free all political prisoners, and um, free all vulnerable populations. Um, compassionate release is something that we are also making a cry for our elders are more susceptible to this virus than anybody else. Our mothers and caregivers, especially those who are pregnant, um, especially those who have immuno um, issues are susceptible to this uh, virus and the government or prison officials, no one is providing the proper care. 
for these folks. So um, call these people. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're moving right along. We have next brother Gregory Mohammed. Brother Gregory is part of Nation of Islam Student Regional Prison Reform Minister for the Delaware Valley. He is a published author and he writes articles in the Final Call newspaper for the Nation of Islam Prison Reform Ministry. Our uh, brother Gregory. Yes. I want to start by saying free Mumir Abu Jamal. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is his Messiah. And I further bear witness that their true servant, divine reminder and divine warner is the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet all those who are on the line and those who are viewing this press conference with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, I salam alaikum. I wanna first start by saying that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has been supporting Mumir from day one, from the time that they unjustly charged him with the killing of a Philadelphia police officer. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan spoke in defense of Mumir Abu Jamal. The nation of Islam has always been in the movement for the freedom of our people. And if you recall the Muslim program, what the Muslims want, we have a point in what the Muslims want. It says we want freedom for all believers of Islam now held in federal prisons. We want freedom for all black men and women now under death sentence in innumerable prisons in the North as well as the South. We want every black man and woman to have the freedom to accept or reject being separated from the slave master's children and establish a land of their own. We know that the above plan for the solution of the black and white conflict is the best and only answer to the problem between two people. That still stands to this day. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad presented the Muslim program to the United States Congress many decades ago. This movement and this fight for our people has never stopped. Myself, I was a victim of the corruption of this country by becoming involved in criminal activity. Where did criminal activity start from? It didn't start from the children of the once slaves in America. We became victims of a criminal society. So it landed me in prison with an unjust sentence of 30 to 60 years. During my incarceration, I started to help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan rebuild the Nation of Islam prison reform program. And I wanna just go fast here because I know we don't have much time, so please bear with me. I wanna go straight to 1982. Between 1982 and 1983, I was incarcerated at SCI Huntington Prison. During that time, I was fighting to get the right to worship for members of the Nation of Islam. As a result of my strong leadership, I was thrown into solitary confinement, which is called B Block at Huntington. The authorities there, they didn't want to outright kill me, so they put me in a situation that they could provoke and incite me. But with the teachings of Islam, the discipline of the FOI, the fruit of Islam, they had no chance of making me res re respond or be a victim of these insights that they had uh, attempted on me. One night, 
I recall being on the fifth tier and I seen several guards come up to the fifth tier and they emptied the inmates out of 10 cells on the fifth tier. I was in the first cell on the, temp, on the fifth tier. So I was wondering what this was all about. They took all the, the inmates out and I didn't get word as to what was going on until the next morning, not by uh, a message or anything like that. I just happened to be in the first cell on the fifth tier, which gave me a view to the bottom floor of B block and the entrance into B block where the Philadelphia sheriffs and other sheriffs from different counties bringing inmates into Huntington that was going back and forth to court. And I noticed Mumir coming through the door and how they had him unusually shackled. So they brought him up to the fifth tier. He walked right past, he walked by my cell. I greeted him, he greeted me back. They took him in the back and I found out that uh, former governor Dick Thornburg had just reinstituted death row and they were using Huntington as the starting point of- Thank death. you. So anyway, I witnessed that taking place. I just want you to know that I've been standing with Pam and all of those fighting for the freedom of Mumia since my release, November 2011. And we will continue to stand for the freedom of our brother with the help of Allah and his true servant, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I thank you all and let us be safe and let us not worry because justice for us as a people is coming very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Muhammad, Muhammad. Okay, so our last speaker is New York Assemblyman Charles Barron. Assemblyman Barron is a member of the New York State Assembly representing the 60th District in Brooklyn. He previously represented Brooklyn's 42nd District in the New York City Council from 2001 until 2013. He's well known as a militant African-American spokesperson, respected and loved well beyond the boundaries of his electoral district. Last month, both Charles and his wife, city council member Inez Barron, fell ill with COVID-19. Assemblyman Barron, go ahead. Well, thank you so much. I first and foremost want to say happy birthday to Mumia. I want to say that we're going to free Mumia and free them all. It is a responsibility that we have as a people because as long as they're locked up, we're all locked up. As Malcolm said, they may be in minimum security, but we're in maximum security. <clears throat> I wanna thank all of you for your prayers, for your positive words, for Inez and I. I had it real bad. I was in intensive care unit. I had pneumonia. I had shortness of breath. I had a temperature of 102. They put me in the intensive care unit and said that it was getting even worse. But as I stood there and had my queen, who was also positive, but didn't have the symptoms, as I sat there and the doctor came in and said, oh, don't worry, you're not gonna die. And I said to myself, you shouldn't even be mentioning death in my name in the same breath because I have work to do. And it is the work to free him political prisoners it is the work to make revolution in America. As we talk about these singular issues, whether it's freeing uh, political prisoners or it's poverty or it's mass incarceration or it's homelessness or it's miseducation, inadequate health care, we suffer from high rates of everything, which is why we are being devastated, ravaged by this disease we have a high rates of blood pressure, high rates of diabetes, you name it, we have it. As I pondered all of that, I wanted us to remember, I had to myself say, I'm going back out there because even those, those issues are all that they are, we need to make revolution in America. The real problem 
It's not just that we have bad diets and yes, we got to eat better. It's not just that we don't exercise enough and yeah, we have to exercise enough. We didn't create poverty. We didn't create unemployment in our communities. We didn't create police terrorism in our community. So we have to make sure that we fight with every breath we have to dismantle, to destroy this racist, parasitic, predatory capitalist system and its warmongering, imperialistic foreign policy. And central to our liberation as an African people is the unification and liberation of Africa. That will liberate all of us in the diaspora and on the continent of Africa. So as we go forward, whatever area we in, doctor, lawyer, elected official, be a revolutionary doctor, lawyer, and elected official. I had the success of getting the New York State Assembly, Black and Latino and Asian Coalition, which is about 62 of us, to give a letter for the freedom of Herman Bell. And they allowed me to set up a reparations and political prisoners committee. We sent the letter out and Herman Bell was free, of course, because of the struggle all along, but may not causation, but there's a correlation between them sending the letter and us getting Herman out. And Seth Hayes, may he rest in peace and power. He also got a letter from that 62 member Black, Latino, and Asian coalition. And they're not radicals and revolutionaries. It took a lot. And we also have a letter for Jalil Montecum, who's coming up now. He's coming up in September. And we got a letter sent to the governor to commute his sentence and let him out now. And we also got a letter uh, sent to uh, for the freedom of my brother and comrade and struggle, Matulu Shakur. So we're going to continue to fight the December 12th movement led by Viola Plummer. And all of us have been fighting hard. And we want to say rest in peace. My brother who made his transition, Father Lawrence Lucas, who's also been a longtime supporter of Mumia. But we will win. And remember this coronavirus, some people call it a colonial virus because our communities are set it up, set up like domestic colonies. They allow for all of this horrible life to happen in our communities. So when a crisis comes, don't just blame it on the diet. Don't just blame it on the lack of exercise. Also blame it on capitalism, racism, imperialism, colonialism, and these sellout Negroes called neo-colonial puppets of the Democratic Party. We're fighting and succeeding to get masks for our people, tests for our people, more ventilators for our people, and getting more food in our community. We're getting that on the move. But after this, revolution is the ultimate and only solution. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Assemblyman Byron. Uh, Santiago, did I hear you or? Yes. Yes. So we just got um, messages from the Philippines. Um, I'm going to need host abilities uh, to screen share this. OK, Santi. All right. I'm Sharon Cabusal Silva, a member of Kapati, the Organization of Families of Political Prisoners here in the Philippines. I'm also a longtime member of Gabriela Women's Alliance. I wish to extend our fraternal uh, greetings to comrade and brother Mumia Abu Jamal, whom I understand is celebrating his birthday today. I also wish to extend the greetings to all the activists and human rights advocates who have gathered today and are speaking out and speaking up in this most difficult time of the COVID pandemic for calling for the release of political prisoners in the Philippines, the US, and in many other countries of the world. 
In the Philippines, they are also engaged in only in the context of the political killings and arrests that have continued to this day, but also in terms of the, uh, uh, the human rights violations that are happening in the context of the enhanced community quarantine that the state has imposed on Luzon, the major island of the country, or one of the major islands of the country where the national capital region is located and where the co coronavirus is, is uh, ravaging and spreading uh, among the population. Um, the state has relied on a very militarist approach to what is essentially a medical or a public health issue they have uh, set up military and police checkpoints where various forms of human rights violations are happening. We are also calling for the release of political prisoners. As you are all perhaps aware, uh, the jails in the Philippines are severely overcrowded with mediocre food and the medical services for all the detainees. And we are very much worried for our loved ones in the case, for example, of my husband, Adelberto Silva, who is already 72 years old, has had a tribal bypass operation and a gallbladder operation, which has weakened his body defenses. And there's also the case of uh, women, el sick and elderly political prisoners, Moreta Alegre, and um, uh, Lilia Bukatkat, and they are detained at the Correctional Institute of Women, where several patients were found. So that was part one. Um, we're going to get into two other short parts. Um, and these were just received in real time from the Philippines, from the National Democratic Movement, fighting for national liberation in the Philippines. Wow, this is fabulous. Amazing. The need or articulated the need to prioritize the release of political prisoners, uh, people who were detained on the basis of their political views, or those who were detained without sufficient legal basis. So we echo this call and have called on the state authorities in the country to facilitate the release of all political prisoners in the country especially the sick and the elderly, um, the pregnant women, women and women among the couples. And we've got one more video that's around one minute long. So we're gonna go ahead and play that. So we have a common struggle. Us from here in the Philippines and with our friends abroad, especially there in the US, to have our political prisoners freed um, either on humanitarian reasons and on grounds of justice during this time of the COVID pandemic. Things they say will never get back to normal. Many of the things that are happening today are the result of decades uh, of the implementation of neoliberal policies. So I think we must all prepare, whether we are inside a prison or whether we are outside in the larger prison that we call human society where capitalism reigns. Um, we have the many tasks to do in the future. And so we take this as an opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to enabling uh, meaningful, if not radical changes in the coming future. So right now we call for freedom for all our political prisoners, freedom for Mumia, freedom for my husband, Adalberto Silva, freedom for all political prisoners in the Philippines, in the US, and all over the world. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share. Um, that was a message from Sharon Cabusao Silva, who is a formal, former political prisoner herself and the wife of a current political prisoner. So from the Philippines to the United States, we say long live international. Wow, wow, that was truly amazing. Thank you, Santiago, for getting that video to us just in the nick of time that just came in. Thank you again. Um, again, thank you to, before we get into the question and answers, I just wanna say thank you to our phenomenal speakers for doing such a great job and being able to be with us on this, on this special day. Um, 
a few announcements before we again get into the question and answers. Uh, we have this again, this is the beginning of this great birthday weekend for Mumia. We have a exciting weekend coming up following after this is tomorrow, uh, six to nine. We have an amazing lineup of incredible folk for a teach in, and you will be able to view it just as how we, we're viewing it here. So don't leave us this week. And we have that going on tomorrow. We have the information up right now on the screen. We have folks such as Angela Davis, Alice Walker, BJ Prashad, Keith Cook, Mumia's brother, Mark Lamont Hill, Janet Africa, Deku Odinga, along this, Laura Whitehorn. So you definitely want to stay tuned for uh, seeing this amazing teaching tomorrow on Mumia's actual birthday, 66th birthday. Right after that, on Saturday, we have uh, in the later afternoon, uh, I think it's six till whenever it ends, and we don't have a flyer just as yet. On that, we have an amazing dance party, DJ dance performances uh, coming up. So you want to stay tuned for that and, and join us on that exciting celebratory event for Mumia. It's not every day we get to do those kinds of events from Mumia where we're just dancing and jamming and seeing performances for a few hours. So stay tuned for that. Again, this is on e, uh, Eastern Standard Time. So just be mindful of, the, um, of, of, of that. And lastly, on Sunday, we have an incredible, actually starting Sunday noon, until Monday uh, noon, as it's now up on the screen, we have an incredible Poetry in Motion, a 24-hour archival celebration of Mumia Abu Jamal. Again, that will be phenomenal. We're going to have uh, curated segments of all things Mumia, performances, activists, poets. Um, so we want you to come along, tune in with us, and. Um, Bring your crew, you know, everyone's home now. So let's uh, let's push this out there. So those are the big events that are happening for the rest of the, the weekend. And any other details or questions around these events, please feel free to reach out to bringmumiahome at gmail.com. Again, that's bringmumiahome at gmail.com and we can share more information and also share with you uh, the Eventbrite link. As it says on the flyer, the links, are there so you can search for the specific event and you can go in register and have all the details on how to view those uh, live events. So also before I get into the Q and A's, we have to wish a happy birthday to polit former political prisoner, Eddie Conway, whose birthday was uh, yesterday. So that's a really big deal that he's here with us and he's celebrating so happy belated to uh, Eddie Conway. And lastly, again, you all must have seen and also was uh, were ready to see brother actor, international human rights activist, freedom fighter, Danny Glover. <coughs> Unfortunately, we did uh, try to get the, a video from him and it was all ready to go, but we weren't able to make contact at any point this week with him. So we are praying and hoping that all is well and that we'll hear from him soon, but unfortunately we did not have um, any latest contact with him to get the, the video that he had wanted to do for us. So I know folks had questions about that and concerns, and so that's the, the response to, um, to that um, update. So we have a question here. Again, if you have questions, this is the time now to, to throw a few out to us. And one of the questions uh, I have here is for, give me one second, is for Janine Africa. So Janine, if you can unmute yourself. The question is, what lesson does the freeing of all the Move 9 give us when it comes to Mumia's case? Uh, I couldn't make out what you were saying, Johanna. Okay, uh, Janine, it's, it's, it's uh, Sophia. Um, so I'll repeat the question oh, again. Sorry. That's fine, that's fine. What lesson does the freeing of all the Move 9 give us when it comes to Mumia, to Mumia's case? Uh, 
the lesson is never give up because we were told that we would never get out of prison, that we would stay there for a hundred years or until we died. But John Africa moved, did not give up and all the support of the people that came along with our family never gave up. And we are sitting here today living proof that the power is in the people. You know, John Africa explained that the people are like a wild mass of energy. And for the people are the majority. The people that's running this system, the officials are the minority. They are the minority and they have to tread lightly in the herd, the people are like a herd, a wild herd of buffaloes, and these officials have to tread lightly and not disturb the herd. And people prove this to be true because there is no way I should be sitting here talking to you on the, on this phone at this press conference based on what these officials told our family, told lawyers, told different activists and groups that were helping to fight for our freedom told them we would never get out of jail, but we are here. And so what I'm stressing to people is no matter how it seems, John Hampton said, no matter how it seems, it appears, the power of righteousness will never betray you. And we are living proof. So people, please never give up. Don't be discouraged and keep the same momentum, the same fire to fight as you did 40 years ago, 30 years ago, because believe it or not, they try not to show it, but the consistency, the determination of people is wearing these officials down. And like I said, we got him off a death row. We can get him out of prison. Yes. Amen to that. Okay, great. Thank you, Sister Janine. Uh, This question is for Lynn Washington. What can we do to expand our reach uh, with the media to tell Mumia's story? I would just suggest that um, just stay on them, uh, offer criticism, but also use your alternative media. It's clear that the mainstream media is not going to cover Mumia or any issue of import uh, for persons of color. Um, it's uh, in the Mumia case, we see that the coverage has been a mile wide. There's been a lot of stories, but it's been an inch thick because um, there hasn't been the in-depth uh, coverage that this case merits. While Mumia's case obviously is about Mumia, it's just reflective of the political prisoners and the systemic injustice that so many people uh, are now imprisoned as a result of. We've heard on this press conference two people that were wrongfully uh, treated by the criminal justice system. Uh, So again, it's just not Mumia. The thing that's most unusual about Mumia's case is that it is not unusual. And the media coverage that Mumia's case has been uh, subjected to also shows that. Thank you. Also, another quick one to follow up, uh, Professor Washington. Are there any independent sources or sources we can use to share the narrative of Mumia and all political prisoners? My suggestion would be to ignore, uh, would be to ignore the uh, mainstream media and use the social media platforms. That's what people are right now. Uh, you know, they're not reading the pages of newspapers. Uh, so use that social media platform. Use the platforms that, like it's being used today. I think that could be much more effective in terms of reaching the people and helping in the mobilization efforts that are needed. Great, thank you. Uh, so this next question is for Black Rap Medusa. How, okay, how are the issues of women and girls in the prisons, how can those issues be better amplified you know, not only in Philadelphia, but statewide? Um, the, the biggest thing you can do is to get online and uh, hashtag free black mamas. Um, also tap into the national bailout, uh, donating, we donate into those care packages that we are providing for um, mothers that we do bail out. Um, just getting out the word on your social media platforms 
um, donating to the GoFundMes, um, getting other people to donate to the GoFundMes, amplifying the issues of the COVID-19 impact on our people. And then if you have access to masks or gloves, I mean, take it to your neighborhood, take it to your community and make sure that those folks in your community have, have access to that as well. Um, I'm gonna drop a GoFundMe um, in the chat box. Um, Y'all can donate to that GoFundMe. And um, yeah, we need all hands on deck for real. Okay, great. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, Pam, I need you to unmute. This question is for you. I hope Pam is still with us. Okay, I'm going to ask a question, Pam, and um, hopefully you'll unmute. Uh, should we call the prisons and Department of Corrections to ask that Mumia and other prisoners like Jerome Coffey come home? Yes, absolutely. That's one of the things that caused the big um, problem with the um, prison. Um, when San what Santi was talking about, this movement is so powerful. When you put that pressure on, there's nothing for them to do but submit. And uh, Mumia called us after 9 o'clock because of those phone calls, because of those tweets. They are important. It's a very important part of this movement and asking people to continue that. Great, thank you. And and another question: um, How can we donate to the work to free Mumia? Two sites you can go to, and you know, the campaign to bring Mumia home, and the mobilization. The number four for Mumia. Those are the two sites: the mobilization to bring Mumia home, the mobilization for Mumia. Okay, great. And um, Raza Khan, I'm wondering if he's still with us. This this question probably more pertains to him, but maybe uh, someone else could answer. get right on my phone. Okay, great. So someone is also asking, like, asking uh, for like paralegals to pressure that for the paralegals to pressure to call for Mumia's release. Is is there any? Inter further inter information on that or further you have, you have to you have to repeat that again because I, I didn't catch all of that. So there's a question uh being asked if there are paralegals that can be uh pressured to call for Mumia's freedom. Pressured? Is that what you said? Uh, you say are there paralegals that can be pressured? Is that what you said? Put pressure. Put oh, pressure. Man, are they doing that? I thought you said, yeah, no, you know, um, Mumia is a paralegal. <laughs> you know what I mean? And a lot of people that uh, that learn and know what they know is because of him. You know, he done got people uh, off of death row. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's just that uh, uh, well, 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 all the paralegals across this nation is doing their job. When they hear his name, they are it. Believe me, sis. I want to know how you get in contact with paralegals. Oh, is that what you're asking? Oh, uh, uh, it depends on uh, 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 what you mean. Uh, uh, out here, uh, in there, uh, or what? You got uh, uh, individuals incarcerated that need a uh, paralegal, or what? I'm not hearing you so clearly. Uh... Brother as a con, but I guess, uh, yeah, I'm not hearing you so clearly. Or oh, what I'm saying uh, from the inside, or yeah, you need a uh, 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 individual that's incarcerated and need assistance. Tell them to contact you. Is that what you're saying? Hello. Yes. Yes. Can you can you hear me? I can hear you now. <laughs> when, uh, the phone keeps cutting off uh, for some reason. Uh, uh, keep coming. I'm asking you: Do you need, uh, as an individual in, that's incarcerated that need a paralegal? You can contact Nation Time Judicial mm -hmm. Search, uh, PO Box One Eight Eight, Sharon Hill, PA. 
Okay, can you repeat one more time, please? Yeah. Nation Time Judicial Research, P.O. Box 188, Sharon Hill, PA, two words like Sharon Hill. Great, okay, we got that, thank you. Um, we have another question here, and this is for, and I hope I'm coming through clearly, this is for Assemblyman Barron. Okay, so the question is, uh, one second, I think I've lost my feed here. Okay, so what have you done to work with uh, your peers on this issue? And what can we do to continue to put the pressure on other elected officials around these issues? Is there anything that can be, you know, you know, done on the legislative? Uh, right, as I said, I, I did get my peers to send letters, but I think the most important thing we can do, radicals, revolutionaries, need to build a radical, independent, political movement and take them out, particularly on a local level and the city council level and the state assembly level where we constitute the majority in our communities, we are controlled by the neo-colonial black puppets of the democratic party. We have to go beyond just reacting to issues and be proactive. We have to go beyond mobilizing around issues and get to organizing for power. The bottom line is power. We have a city council seat. My wife is a city council member. I'm the state assembly member. We have a certain amount of power. We're able to bring material benefits to our community. Three parks renovated over $17 million. We have a two-story youth center run by grassroots brothers and sisters, some that were formerly incarcerated. And then for the political prisoner issue, if you have a little bit of local power, you can force this issue in the state assembly. I have resolutions. We have done stuff for Asada Shakur resolution. We put the spotlight on, most deaf, he has a new name now, came to city hall with me. We were able to get a lot of things done getting these seats of power. We have to take them out. And that we, we wiped out the Democratic Party Club in my beloved East New York. It does not exist anymore. And we're able to get millions of dollars to radicals, revolutionary. On my staff, Viola Plummer is my chief of staff. She's a revolutionary. Omawali Clay, December 12th, was working in my wife's office. So we're able to provide jobs for revolutionaries to continue to do the job in our community. We can't leave no area uncontested. You're not going to be able to vote your way to freedom, but you damn sure can make a big impact by taking one of those seats and maintaining your radical revolutionary edge and take the sellouts, the traitors out. And I can show you how to do it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, we all heard that. Uh, okay, so our last question is um, for Professor Washington. The question is, when does the King's Bench petition decision, sorry, comes to an end? You're on mute, Professor Washington. I, I just said, hear me now, I just unmuted. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that with this uh, King's Bench, that a, that it ordered an investigation to be done. So that investigation uh, that they appointed a judge from outside of Philadelphia to conduct, and then he would make a recommendation. And then from that recommendation, it would be determined whether uh, uh, DA Krasner's office remains in it or members of that office remain in it. So it is, um, the timeline for when this is supposed to be completed, uh, I'm not too sure of. It's going to be over the next couple of a couple of months. But the reality is that when this King's Bench was ordered, it effectively stopped consideration or the timeline for me for Mumia to be uh, his appeals to be heard. 
by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So this is yet another subversion of justice in process by the Supreme Court. And interestingly, the Supreme Court did this when the Supreme Court's uh, uh, actions in the past were the things at issue. Uh, so we are seeing once again, right before our very eyes, a corruption of justice by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you uh, again, all. That's the end of our questions uh, for today. But quickly, again, um, just some quick announcements. Just want to reiterate that tomorrow we are having, uh, and, and yeah, tomorrow we are having again our teaching. And again, that's six till nine. Please, please, please join us for that. That will be. Uh, an incredible event. You can register at Eventbrite and that link uh, can be found in the chat. So again, look for the link in the chat and register there. Also, you can purchase a discounted copy of We Want Freedom by Mumia Abu Jamal from Common Notions Books simply by registering at the Eventbrite link. So that's all <laughs> a big deal. And we thank again Common Notions, who are the who are the publisher of We Want Freedom, for making all of this uh, possible today. This is a big, big, ground groundbreaking undertaking on the technology end. So we thank them a whole lot, and all the team that's behind the scenes that have been pulling great strings to bring forth such an amazing event. And we thank you all for speaking with us, for spending time with us on this day in celebrating. Mumia's birthday and we thank our lovely audience. Uh, the chats are going crazy on our various social media sites with an, with an audience that's just in tune and thankful as well for this phenomenal event. The, the, Mumia, the Mumia movement thanks you all. Again, uh, that's the campaign to bring Mumia home, mobilization for Mumia, Free Mumia, Abu Jamal Coalition, uh, here in New York and on the West Coast. So we thank all the ARGs, and I'm sorry if I'm missing any right now, but we thank all the ARGs for just being down with us in the last month of just organizing these things. So um, I think that's about it. If I miss anything, my team in the back, please feel free to come in, but we are ending on time. Again- And all political prisoners. Free Mumia, happy birthday to Mumia, and we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, time management. Thank Phenomenal. You. All right, on the move. Hi, uh, Johanna, are we off? We're good. Well, uh, no, we right. should get off. We're probably still alive. Yeah, we, we are. On the move, family. On the move, thank you all. On the move, Mia. Freedom all. <laughs>